I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, in 1999 in Alliance, Ohio, David Thorne was accused of hiring a friend to brutally murder the mother of his child. But did he do it? Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, with my fantastic co-host, Alice. I'm not allergic to that word. <laughs> I was just holding that, tight. I was holding that sneeze in, and I couldn't hold it in anymore. <laughs> So I'm not going to lie, I didn't hear the word, but I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have known what it meant anyway, but thank you. You're welcome. It was German. That was from Angelica, who who sent that in, or Angelica. I'm going to go with Angelica. I like that better. I like Angelica better, so the Gesundheit <laughs> was very fitting. <laughs> yes, there you go. I'm, I'm sorry, Angelica. I was I loved that word. I just really had to sneeze. Mm, these things happen, you know? And there are no do-overs in podcasting. We're, just, we're living <laughs> no with your No such thing as editing. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh. Uh. so the people who are bothered by your, like, spit and stuff are going to be totally angry about the sneeze. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, the reason I sneeze is I quite literally am still in a closet recording because it has the best sound quality. But to make the sound quality better, I've been, like, unrolling a, like, a flannel blanket on the floor that I sit on. And it's never been washed, let's be honest. Mm. <laughs> so it's just been mm. collecting dust. And every time I put it out <laughs> to record a podcast, I sneeze. There you go. Those are the sacrifices Alice makes for the podcast. And we appreciate it very much. Very much. We hope you know that, Alice, that we're all we're all very appreciative of the sacrifices you're willing to uh to to put up with to make this podcast a success. And we got an interesting one. This time, Alice, and probably for the next couple of weeks, those of you who listen to our very good friend Maggie Freeling's show, Murder in Alliance, will already be familiar with a story that we are going to tell you. This is the murder of Yvonne Lane, and the father of one of her children, David Thorne, was accused of hiring one of his friends to kill Yvonne and Maggie has taken this up as most of you know Maggie has a show called Unjust and Unsolved the whole premise of which is that if someone is put in jail for a crime they didn't commit then not only is that unjust but that crime is still unsolved and the murder is still out there and she was so taken with this case that she decided to do an entire in-depth investigation an investigation that is ongoing into whether or not David Thorne was falsely convicted and those of you um, who haven't listened to it, do it. Um, I've been, I have been binging it because I'll go back and start listening to it again because she uncovers new information, you know, each week. And I'll go back and she, she doesn't know where the investigation is leading her as she's recording it. So it's so cool to go on the journey, but I'll go back so that I can see how the evidence builds on each other. Yeah, that's right. And currently the show is actually in a hiatus for a couple of weeks. So those of you who are having withdrawals from this story, this is an opportunity to dive in deeper. And a lot of you had reached out to us and wanted us to cover this as well and sort of do our take on it. So we talked to Maggie about it and Maggie not only encouraged us to do it, but she gave us all her resources. So we have all the stuff we normally use, transcripts from the trial, pictures of the crime scene, everything really that you could hope to know about this case. And so what we're hoping to do is walk through that evidence with you so that you have a better understanding of the case. Now, we are not doing what Maggie is doing. Maggie is in the middle of an investigation. She's re-interviewing people. She's looking at, at evidence and how it was presented and whether or not it was legitimate. We will try and tell you when her investigation has maybe made us question what was presented at trial 
but that is really what Maggie's doing. So if, if you hear this and you have more questions, really, whether you do or not, listen to her show. It's really good. And anybody who likes true crime is going to enjoy what Maggie is doing over in Murder in Alliance. So I think that is enough introduction. And for those of you who don't know this story, who haven't been listening to Murder in Alliance, we'll give you some background. On April 1st, 1999, Tanya Lane, Yvonne Lane's mother, went to her daughter's house to pick up one of her grandchildren for school. So she was surprised when, despite her repeated efforts, no one came to the door. Eventually, she entered the unlocked home and discovered a horrifying scene. Tanya found her daughter's body lying in a pool of blood. The only blessing was that Yvonne's five young children had been left unharmed. The scene was a disturbing one. Yvonne's throat had been cut so deeply that she was all but decapitated. Her larynx and vocal cords were slashed, as were the major arteries in her throat. A classic arterial spray pattern was on the glass doors leading to a deck. Incongruous in the crime scene photos are the two German Shepherd puppies looking in through the blood-stained doors. Her oldest children were upstairs, locked in their rooms from the outside. Her youngest son was in his crib, dressed, which was unusual given that he slept in a diaper. The break came in the case a few months after the murder when Rose Moore and her boyfriend, Chris Campbell, showed up at the police station and told the cops that they'd run into Joe Wilkes the night of the murder. Joe had shown them a knife and told them he was in town to kill a girl. When the cops brought Joe in, he said that David Thorne, the father of one of Yvonne's children, had paid him to kill her. David was arrested and brought to trial, with Joe as the chief witness. David was convicted, but to this day, people question whether or not he was really involved. Brett, before we move on, I know you know this, but life is just so busy, full-time podcasting, full-time lawyering, and with two little kids at home, it's so hard to get food on the table in time, which is why I'm so excited about our sponsor, Green Chef. Green Chef makes it so easy to eat the immune-boosting foods you need to stay healthy and fuel a jam-packed end to summer. Green Chef takes care of meal planning, grocery shopping, and even some food prep, giving you more time to tackle back to school season. No matter what recipe I get from Green Chef, my boys gobble it up and I don't even have any for leftovers despite the huge portions because they just love it. No, Alice, Green Chef is one of my favorite sponsors for a reason. We recently had the chicken con queso at my house and it is incredible. Green Chef's expert chefs design flavorful meals that go way beyond ordinary, no matter what's on your menu. So if you want to join us and be a part of Green Chef, go to greenchef.com slash prosecutors100 and use code prosecutors100 to get $100 off, including free shipping. That's greenchef.com slash prosecutors100 and prosecutors 100 to get $100 off, including free shipping. And don't forget, if you've enjoyed HelloFresh in the past, they now own Green Chef. And and combined, they offer a wider array of meal plans to choose from. There's something for everyone. You can switch between the brands, and now our listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount. So try Green Chef and learn why they are the number one meal kit for eating well. So I think you can see already why this is an interesting case and one that is captivating in a lot of different ways. I mean, already unusual. You have this, this case that's gone cold. that seems like maybe they're never going to solve it. And then you have these two people come in to the police station with what is kind of a crazy story. If you think about it, this idea that this man Joe Wilkes just told these people, like, hey, I, uh, I'm here to kill a girl. It's already crazy. 
right? And as we're going to talk about, you can see why they didn't believe him at the time because that's not the kind of thing one typically says to random friends in the mall. But (laughs) that is the heart of this case. This case is, in so many ways, all about Joe Wilkes and whether or not you believe what he said. Because this is essentially a murder-for-hire case, It's important to understand there's no real evidence against David Thorne himself. Everything in the case depends on whether or not Joe Wilkes killed Yvonne. And if he did, if the story he told about David hiring him to do so holds water. So we're going to walk through the timeline in this case. The timeline is very important. This is one of those where the timeline is going to definitely take more than five minutes. and weird about this or maybe it's not weird so much but we're going to break this down based on a couple different things there's what david has said and what david has maintained to be the course of events over the days leading up to this murder ever since he was convicted 20 years ago there's what joe wilkes testified to in trial now we're going to tell you how that story has changed but for the purpose of this timeline we're basically going to give you Joe's trial testimony. And then there's testimony from other people in the trial about the things that happened around this time. Remember, for David to be guilty, Joe had to do it and David had to pay him. So the fact, whether or not you think the story that Joe tells is plausible is critically important because if you don't believe it's plausible, then the entire thing falls apart. So what you should be thinking about when we go through this timeline and we talk about the evidence is, is what Joe is saying, does it make sense? And is it corroborated by the statements and what other witnesses saw? So we'll dive into that with that in mind. So we'll start in early 1999. Remember, the murder is discovered on April 1st, 1999. Sometime late January, February, unclear exactly when this happened, but David is ordered to pay $358 in child support for the child he shared with Yvonne, a little boy named Brandon. By March, he owed around $700 in back child support. We start with this because eventually the story the police is going to tell is that David did not want to pay this child support. He wanted custody of his child, and that was the motive for this crime, and we will come back to that later. So let's move forward to March 31st, 1999, and this is an early day. It starts at 4.30 a.m. when David clocks into work. He works until about 12.30 p.m., at which point he buys some fish at the Fish Connection. This may seem strange, but David was into exotic animals. So he had a fish tank with some exotic fish in it, and he also had some tiger cubs, which will also become important in this case. So he stops at the fish connection around 2 p.m. He drops the fish off at his house and says he cleans up, takes a shower. At around 4 p.m., David leaves his home, heading over to his girlfriend Amy's house. He sees Joe Wilkes walking down the road and picks him up to give him a ride. This was something that David often did for Joe, as Joe had no other form of transportation, and David had kind of taken this big brother slash father figure role in Joe's life. Joe had a difficult childhood. He never really had a family. He was bouncing around from person to person, and and David was one of the few rocks that Joe had to depend on. So whenever David could help him, He would, and this is pretty much universal. Joe says it, David says it, everybody who knew David says it. There's no question that David and Joe did have a close relationship. Now, according to Joe Wilkes, David picks up Joe and drives him to the Carnation Mall. This had been something they had talked about before. David had told Joe that he wanted Yvonne taken care of that he didn't want to pay child support anymore, that he wanted custody of his son, and he wanted Joe to take care of it. So the plan was to take Joe to the Carnation Mall, where Joe would buy a knife, he would buy a glove, and he would get himself a room in the hotel that was attached to the mall. According to Joe, 
in his trial testimony, David gave him a hundred dollar bill and tells him to get a room, buy some gloves, and a knife. Joe goes to the Kmart and bought the gloves. He did not buy the knife at the time. He said that David had prior plans and didn't want him to waste any time, and it sort of urged him to be quick about it. So his reasoning for not buying the knife at the time was he would buy it later, so he just picked up the gloves. I think we'll stop here for a second. This is the first weird thing about Joe's statement. You know, we I get it. David's in a hurry, but he's not so much in a hurry that he doesn't want Joe to get the knife that he's going to use to kill his girlfriend. That would seem to be the most important thing going on in David's life right then. So it's strange to me that Joe tells a story about only buying the gloves at the time, and he's going to come back and buy the knife later. Especially when we know that Joe doesn't have a car, and uh, if you don't want to draw suspicion to yourself, especially if you're collecting items that could be incriminating later on. Gloves might be weird. It's March. It's kind of warm. It might be cold. You might be getting gloves because it's warm. But a knife, you know, going to buy a knife and walking home with it could really make someone's alarm bells go off, right? And so if um, David is wanting Joe to be discreet, it seems strange that he wouldn't drive him to go buy a knife. Yeah. Because like you said, he knows he knows that he's really, he's not Joe's only form of transportation, but he's certainly one of them. And once again, this is the night where Joe's supposed to kill David's girlfriend. So you would think, you know, if Joe got back in the car with me, I would say, let me see the knife. You know, <laughs> I want to see the knife that you just bought that you're going to use. I want to make sure you got a knife that's going to do the job. You know, that would be the thing I would ask when he got back in the car. And if he got in the car... With some gloves. I think they were actually just batting gloves, too. They weren't even, like, regular gloves. I would be like, dude, go back in there and get the knife. What, what are you doing? You know? Um, but he doesn't do that, apparently, according to Joe. He gets back in the car, and they drive back to David's house to pick up his tiger cub. So, after this, it's around 4.30 p.m. when David drops off Joe at the home of the Enochs, which was a family that Joe was staying with. Uh, David hung out for about 45 minutes and then drove on to his girlfriend, Amy's house again. You know, he's kind of going back and forth between Amy's house and seeing Joe and dropping Joe off and picking Joe up. And, and that's where he stayed until he left for his martial arts class that night. Now, this is important because David has a rock-solid alibi that night he is at martial arts class and even better that tiger cub we mentioned he is going to take with him so the tiger cub is going to be at the martial arts class providing him the perfect alibi because not only is he there but no one's gonna forget the night that that david takes his tiger cub to the martial arts studio Right. There's two points of that that make it a an airtight alibi. One, you're not going to forget David. You might, you know, think about going to a class. There's a number of people in the class. You might forget a, if a specific person is there, but not the person with the cub. And second, even if you can't remember the time and day of that class, you could remember it was the class with the tiger cub. And working backwards with lots of witnesses, you can narrow in on the time and date of that particular class. So it actually works in his favor in two ways. And it also works against him in a way. You know, we talked about the weird part of Joe's story and not buying the knife, which is one of the things that sort of makes me doubt what Joe's saying. What makes me wonder about David, what a coincidence, right? Just so happens to be the night you took the tiger cub to the martial arts class, establishing yourself with a rock solid alibi that everyone will remember and everyone can testify about. And that happens to be, of all nights, that happens to be the night that on again, off again, girlfriend, who also is the mother of your children, to whom you owe back child support, is brutally murdered. That is quite the coincidence. You sound so skeptical, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only I'm only saying what uh, common, comments on YouTube will say. <laughs> no, somebody will say, I've already made up my mind. But here's the thing. Um, the reason Brett says that is because these are things that are going to be that the prosecution can insert doubt into his alibi for the jurors. And all the jurors need to think is, huh, is that plausible? So that's what we're presenting this to you for. Is this plausible? 
Is it possible that the one day, or maybe he brought his tiger cub a lot? Probably not a lot. Um, otherwise, his alibi would not be quite as airtight. Is is this a little bit too coincidental, too good of an alibi? Right. And the prosecution, someone is going to use this against him. It's either the truth or Joe Wilkes is going to use this against him because Joe tells the police eventually that David was very clear the murder had to happen that night. It had to happen before he left the martial arts class because the Tiger Cub would be there and everyone would remember it and no one would be able to pin it on David. So it certainly becomes important. Maybe it's just a coincidence or maybe it's a sign of guilt. You can decide for yourself as we move on with the case. So whatever the case, whether David, whether this is a setup or not, from 7 p.m. to 10.30 p.m., without question, David is at his class with his tiger cub. After class, he went back to Amy's house, his girlfriend's house, and after that, he returned home. Now, according to the trial, around 7 p.m. that night, according to the Enox and Joe, Joe tells Karen that he's going to meet David at the Carnation Mall that night, and he will be spending the night with him. Now, this is important because Joe um, is is essentially homeless at this point, and he is living with the Enoch family. Uh, It's a friend of his, and their family kind of took him in. So he tells them preemptively that he's not going to be coming home that night. Now, Karen's husband, Brent, then gave Joe a ride to the mall. Karen did not see Joe again until the next morning. Around 8 o'clock, Rose Moore clocks out of her job at the Carnation Mall. She and her boyfriend, Christopher Campbell, go to the food court to get something to eat. Now, according to Joe Wilkes, At 8 o'clock, Brent Enoch drops him off at the Carnation Mall. Joe says he's wearing a pair of black wind pants, Nike shoes, and a Nike jacket. Joe goes to his room, and he said that he did some cocaine and acid that David had given to him earlier that evening. Afterwards, Joe says that he goes down to the Walmart and buys the knife that he didn't buy earlier, remember? It is at this time that Joe says he runs into Christopher Campbell, an old friend. Christopher was with his girlfriend, Rose Moore. Joe sat down with them and started talking. Joe didn't remember what they discussed because he said he was very high. A couple of things about this. Number one that I think is interesting. He says that David gave him the cocaine and the LSD. This, you know, I sort of stumbled upon this when I was going through various transcripts and everything. I don't know of any evidence that David is into drugs or sells drugs or has access to cocaine and LSD. Maggie might know better about that. But to me, this is another part of the story that's a little weird because I'll just go ahead and tell you, I don't know where to get cocaine and LSD. And I feel like most people who don't either do cocaine and LSD or sell cocaine and LSD, couldn't just go get it if they wanted to. So it's weird to me that Joe is saying that David got this for him. So I'm really interested to know whether David has any history of this or not. Because if he doesn't, I don't know where he would have gotten that. It's not easy to just go find the cocaine, you know? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) maybe I'm being naive, but I just don't. I don't even know where I would start if if today I was like, man, I need to get some cocaine and LSD for my hitman. I just don't know where I would where I would do that. And you know, presumably the reason Joe gave um the reason David gave Joe the drugs was to take the edge off to make killing easier. But typically when you're giving drugs to someone for free, you usually do it together as well. You know, and like you said, I don't think there's been any indication. I haven't seen any evidence that David was into these drugs and you can't just like get it. You know, I mean, we, we prosecute these sorts of things. They're not just readily available if you do not deal in those circles. Yeah. And, and the other thing I totally get giving him some drugs to take the edge off. I would not give him LSD though. I don't think you give LSD to your hitman. maybe some cocaine. But LSD, I mean, you're kind of you're kind of dancing with the devil if you give him LSD because knows who knows what he'll do, right? Now I will say this, and this is the weird thing about this, and we're going to talk about this a lot. This actually makes a lot of sense on the other hand because we just said when we started this show, 
who tells these random people they run into at the mall, I'm going to go kill somebody? Well, maybe somebody who's high out of their mind on cocaine and LSD. That might be the kind of person who would do that. And that might be a reason why um, Christopher and Rose don't directly report it because they can probably tell that Joe is high out of his mind and high people say things they don't always mean. Because remember, they didn't report this. They didn't report this for months. Now, Rose testified at trial that Chris introduced her to Joe as they had once gone to school together. Rose testified that Joe told them he was there to kill a girl and pulled a knife from his pants to show them. Rose says she didn't really remember what the knife looked like. She would testify that the supposed murder weapon could have been the knife she was shown. Uh, This is, by the way, very common if one of your witnesses doesn't know the knife, they can't remember it, what you do is show them what you think to be the murder weapon and say, is it possible it could have been this and hope that they said it's possible. But what they just told you was, I don't remember. And so it doesn't necessarily mean the weapon you're showing them is the murder weapon or that they remember it. It's more they're kind of like, I don't know, I told you I don't remember. So just so you know, that's a tactic. And I'm not sure that the way uh, her testimony went necessarily should indicates that she recognized the weapon, just that she didn't remember anything about the weapon and couldn't rule out that the murder weapon was not what she saw that night. And we're going to talk about this um, later, but this is also a clever little thing Rose does. If, you know, maybe she's just telling the truth, but the knife that she describes to the police when she goes in to talk to the police does not fit the murder weapon. So now by the time of trial, she doesn't really remember what it looks like. And she's like, yeah, that could be it. So there's also that little angle that adds some, it's a little, it's a little slippery what's going on in this testimony. On the stand, Rose also stated that Joe seemed nervous and shaky. Also, by the way, someone who is high on LSD and cocaine probably also seems nervous and shaky in the sense that they probably can't stay still. They're probably scratching themselves and twitching and looking over their shoulder. They may even be paranoid. So I just note that in the sense that it could be nervous and shaky because he's about to kill someone. It could also be that he's exhibiting signs of being high as well. Now, Chris testifies that Joe said his girlfriend dropped him off at the mall because they were going to have a party at a room in the Comfort Inn. Joe told him that his girlfriend had given him some money to take care of some business for her. Joe was shady about it, and Chris kept pressing until Joe pulled out a knife and opened it up. Chris said he knew at that point what Joe meant. Joe said he got the knife from Kmart. Chris testifies that the knife was a folding knife and said the knife the prosecution showed him matched the knife he saw. He testified that Joe told him his girlfriend didn't like the person he was going to kill. Now, notice that Rose and Chris are supposed to be standing next to each other, engaging in one conversation with Joe, but that their memory of the conversation is very different. Um, And this, I mean, this happens. People's memories fade. We've talked about this a lot. It doesn't necessarily mean one of them is uh, lying, but it is interesting that you would think this is a very memorable conversation. Someone you think might just be spouting off random words like, oh, I'm going to go kill someone. Yeah, sure. But then when the person pulls out a knife, you would think that's a pretty memorable conversation, yet they have different memories as to who sent them, who sent Joe to kill whom. Yeah, and this is where lawyers really make their money. There's a lot of things lawyers do that anybody could do, right? I mean, a lot of times you have witnesses who'll tell you exactly what happened, and you just kind of stand up there and say, so what happened next? And after that, what happened? You know, and they just sort of make the case for you, right? But here, this is interesting because you've got these two witnesses who are absolutely critical, the people who gave you Joe Wilkes, and the story they're telling doesn't match up. About the only thing in common is Joe says he's there to kill a girl. Right. But lots of other stuff is not really fitting. And so the defense attorney, a good defense attorney, is going to do exactly what Alice just said. He's going to point out all the ways that these two witnesses who supposedly were at the exact same event for the exact same conversation that you would think no one would forget. 
right? I mean, who forgets the time the guy told you he was going to murder somebody and pulled out a knife, and then lo and behold, that night somebody was murdered brutally with a knife? Surely you would remember that. You know, that is not a conversation you would forget. And for the prosecution, you kind of do what Alice also did, where you just sort of say, like, look, you know, memory is a tricky thing, and yes, they both remembered slightly different things, and that should actually give you comfort. Because if they remembered the exact same thing, it would make you think that they got their story straight. They talked about this. They came up with the story they were going to tell. And then they told the exact same story. Well, that didn't happen. They clearly didn't get their stories together because they are telling a slightly different story. And the question you have to ask yourself is, does that make them more believable or less believable? This is a very strange story that Chris tells in, in a critical way. This whole girlfriend thing. Like, where does that come from? Right? That all of a sudden Joe is saying that his girlfriend dropped him off and his girlfriend wants him to kill this person because she doesn't like them. That's a weird thing to say. And it's a weird thing to say if you're Joe and you're high because even if you're thinking, well, Joe's probably, you know, on the one hand, he's telling them exactly what he's going to do. But on the other hand, he's creating this fabrication to protect David. Why would he do that? Why not just not tell them he's going to kill somebody? It's weird that the thing he would fabricate is the thing about the girlfriend. All great points, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Alice. No, no. I mean, you're especially you're particularly right here. And for the, uh, by the way, for those of you listening, we really don't know what happened. We're trying to just present what the facts and the evidence are so far and so we're showing you what goes through every lawyer's minds as they hear the testimony so we're not trying to play one side or the other the prosecution or the defense we really are these are questions that every lawyer is thinking now the words that come out of the lawyer's mouth is going to be the side that you know advocates for their side whether they're the prosecution or the defense but you guys are hearing our stream of consciousness of what we're thinking when we hear this trial testimony in court and I really do think this is the way that a lot of lawyers, prosecutors, whatever, process information. Like you hear the story and you're thinking about the story and you're thinking about the holes in the story. And then you're looking at the the more concrete evidence you have. And you're trying to see what story fits with the evidence. Like how 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 do I work this out to some semblance of what actually happened that night? And we're going to continue to do this because you there are just little things throughout this case that are strange and make you have doubts and then make you think David did it or Joe did it and then make you think they didn't do it. And we're just going to keep coming back to that. Alice, before we move on, I want to talk about one of our favorite sponsors, PDS Debt. I can tell you I've been out of law school now for a long time and I am still paying my student loans. And everybody knows it's been a tough time for all of us. And debt can be difficult to deal with, particularly when interest rates are high and you have trouble even paying the minimum payment. And how many of you feel like old debt or bad financial decisions are holding you back in life? Well, our sponsor, PDF Debt, has customized 0% interest options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal or student loans, medical bills, collections, or any other type of debt. PDS Debt is so confident they can save you money, they are giving our listeners with eligible accounts $25 Visa gift cards just for learning how to handle their debt. All you need to do is complete their quick online debt assessment and find out how much you can save. Bad and fair credit are accepted and anyone can start saving now. Go to pdsdebt.com slash tp and find out how to resolve your debt now. Now, when you when you go to PDS Debt, you'll need $5,000 in eligible debt to qualify. And if you do qualify, you can roll all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment. You can save thousands in interest and fees, and you can pay off your debt in a fraction of the time with one low payment each month. This is an opportunity to clear up your credit so you can start using it to make financial moves in the future. If you are making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down, this program is for you. And I know a lot of you or in that situation, the average American with credit card or personal loan debt over $10,000 ends up paying back two and a half times what they originally spent. 
PDS is offering a $25 Visa gift card to listeners with eligible accounts just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash tp. That's pdsdebt.com slash tp. Take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash tp. At this point, we have a very strange situation with... Joe doing some stuff that seems inexplicable if his story is true. And then the story we're hearing from other people, which also seems strange. And so it's like, where do we fit all this in? Well, in any event, at around 930, according to Joe, he goes back to his room. Remember, he has rented a room at the hotel that's going to be sort of his base of operations there. He was, And he did that with a $100 bill. So we know that he was he says that david gave him a 100 dollar bill he bought the room with a 100 dollar bill he then bought the gloves he then bought the knife he did all that with that 100 dollars according to joe he goes back to his room he sort of steals himself for what he's going to do he then leaves to walk to Yvonne's house it is 3.5 miles away so it's a long way <laughs> to Yvonne's house from the hotel you might al- you might almost wonder was there not a hotel any closer and he says that he walks down Main Street. So he's walking down the main drag from the from the hotel to Yvonne's house. This is around 930 when he says he left. The average person walks about three miles an hour, maybe a little faster. So he's looking to get to Yvonne's house around 1030, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe a little bit later. He's already cutting it close on what David had told him because remember, David's martial arts class is over by 1030, so he is now heading home at that point, but Joe is just now getting to Yvonne's. He says he gets to the house, he knocks on the door, and the door is unlocked, which he opens. Now, this is consistent with both the statement of one of Yvonne's children who says that she actually told him to go lock the door, and he kind of got scared because he had to go downstairs and it was dark, and so he didn't lock the door. And he just went back upstairs and told her it was locked. And it's also consistent with what other people have said about the fact that Yvonne didn't really lock the door very often either. So not surprising that the door is unlocked. By the way, can we just say that I hope that kid isn't scarred for life that they didn't lock the door. This is like the scare. I think all of us are, you know, our worst nightmare is we forget to lock one door at night. And this is the night that, you know. Joe gets to walk in, if it is Joe, uh, into Yvonne's house, kind of unobstructed. I thought the same thing, and I heard him later on say that it wouldn't have mattered because whoever killed her knew her, and I think that's true, and so she would have let them in either way. So I think you're right. I worried about that too, but I think he, he recognizes that it really didn't matter. Even if he'd have locked the door, they still would have gotten in, so... But I, I think that's right, but I'm glad to hear he's not scarred because I'm a little bit scarred. I know. So Joe starts walking up the stairs. The house is kind of a three-level deal with sort of the entranceway. I think there's a crib downstairs with one of the children in it. Then there's some stairs that go up to the second floor where there's like the kitchen and there's a living room and a dining room and there's like a deck um, off to the side. And then you go up some more stairs and that's where the kids' rooms are. That's what I picture, what I've understood the layout to be. So he's walking up the stairs towards the second floor, and as he's doing that, Yvonne is coming down the stairs. You probably heard him come in. He might have said something. Either way, she's coming down the stairs, and she sees Joe. And Joe tells Yvonne that David wanted him to swing by and see how she was doing. Yvonne sort of welcomes him into the house. They sit down on the couch and they start talking. At some point, Joe removes the knife from his pocket and is sort of holding it down by his side. Yvonne turns her head, and when she does, according to Joe, this is when he acts. He grabs her hair, pulls her hair, and then cuts her throat. He says in his statement to the police and subsequently in the trial, that at this point she sort of lurches towards the glass doors that Alice mentioned earlier, the ones with the German Shepherd 
puppies on the other side. She then turns and asks Joe why. He tells her because David wanted him to. At this point, she collapses to the floor. Joe is totally freaked out by this. He turns to run. He runs into like a dresser that also had a TV on it. He knocks over the dresser. The TV falls off the top of the dresser and on to Yvonne's body. David had told Joe that there was money on the third floor and that he should go up and take it to make all this look like a robbery. But Joe was so freaked out by this. And you can imagine if you just murdered someone in this brutal, violent fashion that you might be, that he just ran out of the house and down Main Street towards the mall. So he's basically running down Main Street, heading back towards the mall, 3.5 miles away. Along the way, there's a ditch with like a drain in it, kind of like in, if you've seen It, the one that the little boy gets pulled into. So he throws the knife into that drain. He then keeps going. There's a McDonald's. At the McDonald's, he dumps the gloves that he had, the baseball gloves, and he goes back to the hotel and essentially sits in the bed, freaked out for the rest of the night, thinking about what he has done. According to David, at around 1 a.m. that night, he finally gets back to his house and he goes to bed. The next day is April 1st, 1999. David clocks in at work at 6.10 a.m. So it was a short night for David since he went to bed at 1. At 8.30 a.m., Joe calls David at his house from a payphone. The call lasts 8.7 seconds. Joe says it's such a short call because he realized that David wouldn't have been at home. He would have been at work, but Joe doesn't have his phone number. At 9 a.m., according to Joe, David arrives at the mall. He asks Joe if it's done, and Joe says it is. David says he doesn't want to know anything about it and told him that he would be giving him $200 later. So note... Um, the $100 was just to buy supplies and get the room, but the cost of hiring Joe as the hitman, according to Joe, is just $200. And, you know, people people balk at that, right? Like, I've heard people say, oh, so, you know, $200 to kill somebody, that, that seems like way too low. In my experience, it's kind of shocking what people will kill other people over. And they'll kill people for a lot less than that. You got to remember, this is not a professional hitman. If this happened, this is David asking a friend to take care of this problem for him, and then he's paying him some money, and and maybe this is just an initial payment on what he's going to give him later. So to me, the $200, even though it's shocking, it's not necessarily surprising when it comes to what a life is, is worth in this world. And remember, Joe is homeless. He's living with, you know, friends, family. Uh, he doesn't have a car. He bums rides off other people. $200 is a, a lot for him. And so the price, remember, is what motivates the individual, where they are situated in their life at the time. And so what Joe sees is he got drugs out of it. And this is someone, David is someone he admires and looks up to, loves, calls all the time, wants the affirmation of. So $200 plus, you know, the love and affirmation of someone he admires could potentially be enough. Sometime in the morning, Karen sees Joe again. Remember, Joe had told Karen that he wasn't going to return that night because he was going to the mall and would be staying elsewhere. Karen said at the trial that Joe was unusually quiet that morning. When she asked him what was wrong, he told her that he and David had stayed up all night. Karen would recall that the next morning, Joe picked up the paper, something he would had never really done before, and exclaimed that the mother of David's little boy had been murdered. Over the next few days, Joe would repeatedly mention that David owed him money, to the extent that if he left the house, he would remind Karen to ask David for the money if she saw him. He told her it was for helping clean out his grandfather's garage. So a couple things about this. Now we said there's going to be, it's going to be a back and forth on things that make you think that Joe did it and David was in on it and things that make you don't. This is a very understated but strange comment 
that or a couple strange comments that Joe made to Karen. Now remember, Karen has no dog in this fight. She has no reason to lie. She's the person that Joe is staying with at the time. If it's true that the day after the murder, the morning after the murder, Joe said that he and David had stayed up all night, it's very strange for him to bring David into this, right? Like, what a coincidence. I mean, imagine Joe had nothing to do with it. He doesn't know that Yvonne has been murdered. You know, last time he saw David was when he went off to to the martial arts studio. What a coincidence that he happens to say that he and David were up all night the night before. Strange thing to say. Then there's the money thing. What a coincidence that David just happens to owe him money for what he says is cleaning up the grandfather's garage, but what later will be said to be payment for the murder. Quite a coincidence. Now, maybe these are coincidences that some corrupt police officers or maybe desperate police officers are going to use to try and tie this murder to Joe, but you almost have to think it's something like that because I don't think Karen's lying. I think these things definitely happened. I think Joe definitely said these things, and they are strange things for him to say if he has nothing to do with Yvonne's death. Here's a good place to mention the rule that is invoked at the beginning of each trial. The rule is that – what is the rule? The rule. I don't. I don't even know the citation because everyone just calls it. And no one knows the citation. The rule. <laughs> yeah, everyone and just what says you mean the rule. by the rule uh, when you invoke it is that you want everyone who will testify in the trial for the prosecution or the defense to be excluded from the trial room, the courtroom. Remember, courtrooms are supposed to be open to the public unless it's a sealed hearing or trial, which is very rare, because we. Uh, decided as a country that we wanted the judicial system to be open to the public eye. So anyone, any one of you can walk into just about, maybe not right now because of COVID, but generally you're able to walk into any courtroom and watch any proceeding you want. That's your right as a citizen in this country. But when you say you invoke the rule, You want witnesses to be outside of the room so that they can't hear what other witnesses are testifying about and they can't see where their story fits with others. So those of you who may think Karen's trying to help, you know, the prosecution, she has no idea what the prosecution's theory is because the only time she's in the courtroom is when she comes in to take the oath to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth and to testify on the stand. So these questions are being asked to her and we are beginning to see, you know, what the prosecution's theory is take form as we read through all of the evidence presented. But Karen doesn't see any of that. And that's what we mean when we say Karen doesn't really have a dog in this fight. She has to answer questions truthfully. And from her perspective, these questions may not mean very much to her. So what if Joe picked up, a, you know, the morning paper? It makes sense that Joe would exclaim uh, about someone he knew, Yvonne, being murdered. I would certainly say something if I saw in the paper that someone I knew, even tangentially, um, had been murdered. So she may not think any of these things are important, but this is why it's important for each side to decide who their witnesses are and what evidence comes in. You may be saying to yourself, well, the prosecution, they could have told her what to say beforehand and... Told her this is this is what you have to say to make this work. Okay. The chances of that happening are basically nil. If they had done that, she would have said something by now. I mean, it's been 21 years. She hasn't got anything to lose. If the prosecution had brought her in and said, look, we need you to lie. We need you to say X, Y, and Z so that we can, in this very sort of, you know, subtle way, incriminate Joe, uh, we would know that by now. There may be corruption in this case, and there may be some stuff that, that was done improperly or even done maliciously, but nobody told Karen what to say. She is saying what she remembers, and I think we can take this to the bank, that all this stuff happened. Like Alice said, maybe Karen is looking back through the lens of what she knows, and like the newspaper thing is a good example. Maybe Joe picked up the newspaper all the time, but she never noticed because it didn't matter. It was a minor thing. It totally went over her head until the day he read about someone he knew being murdered. And she did remember that. And then later on, she hears that Joe did it. And she's like, well, he had never picked up a newspaper before except that day. Right. And you can see how she would assign importance to something that's not actually that important. 
and and make a big deal out of it. But I do think it happened. I don't think there's any question it happened. I think it happened that Joe said these things. One funny story about the rule. Um, I don't know if I've told this one before. We were far enough in the podcast where I'm going to start retelling my stories. <laughs> but there's a story out of where Alice and I work about how a young lawyer stood up in a judge who'd been a judge for many, many, many years, decades, and said, Your Honor, I invoke the rule. And the judge said, Which rule are you invoking? And the guy, he had no idea. It was just, he'd always heard people say, I, I invoke the rule. So he thought you're supposed to do that. And so he did it, but he didn't actually know what rule he was invoking or what the rule did. I don't know what the number is. It's like 600 and something. But <laughs> like Alice said, what the rule does is it keeps the other witnesses out of the courtroom while other people are testifying. So, you know, if you ever invoke the rule, make sure you know what it means. <laughs> you know what this means. We now have to make sure we know what rule it is before we go into the courtroom the next every time. now and then but i, I look remember. it up a lot and i can't hold it in my brain it's like as i get older my brain gets more holes in the sieve that is my mind I know. anyways I know. that's just a that's a me problem <laughs> brett before we move on i have to say i'm so excited about our sponsor audible i love to read um but it's just hard to get reading time in with a physical book these days with two little kids running around and constantly driving from witness interview to witness interview audible solves that problem for me i can listen to my favorite books ranging from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs languages business motivation all sorts of books on Audible, and it's on the go with me. Spoken word entertainment all in one place. Yeah, Alice, I have been an Audible member for years. I love it. I'm currently listening to The Orchid Thief, which is a great book with true crime flavor out of Florida. I recommend it to all of you. And the great thing about Audible is I can listen to it whenever I want. If I'm in the car, if I'm going for a run, if I'm in the gym, or if I just need a break at home, Audible is always there. It is my playlist for life. And now new members can try Audible for 30 days on us. All you have to do is visit audible.com slash TP or text TP to 500, 500 That's right, Alice. Go to audible.com slash TP or text TP to 500, 500 and find out why we love Audible. Every book's an adventure and there's one waiting for you. So David stated that at 10.15 a.m. that day, he went to AutoZone and then to McDonald's where he ordered three sausage McMuffins, no egg. He got the order wrong, so he had to go back to McDonald's to get the rest of his order. That's why he was gone for so long, because it wasn't until 10.45 a.m. that David went back to the shop. Now at 2 p.m., David gets a call from his grandfather that Yvonne has been murdered. On April 5th, the morning of the funeral, David arrived at Karen's house for the first time since the murders. Joe got in the truck with David, and they sat in the drive for over half an hour. They then went to a store where Joe bought some beer to make up for beer he drank at the house. Joe came back to the house and told Karen he'd been paid by David. The next day, he went shopping and bought a pair of Nike socks, new tennis shoes, roller blades, and a pair of work boots. Now, this was all trial testimony. This is really interesting because we not only have Joe saying that he got money from David, but there's kind of proof that he got money because he was able to buy all these things that cost money that he wouldn't otherwise be able to afford. Yeah, there's a lot going on in this. Number one, the fact that it was the morning of the funeral that David supposedly paid him is i mean that's that's cold if it's true right i mean david is on his way to the funeral and he's stopping by joe's to pay him for the work he did now like alice said this is another one where it's a strange coincidence if it's just a coincidence because joe says he got paid money 200 bucks that day from david and lo and behold he's buying beer that he owes brent because he's been drinking his beer and he's buying all this stuff from kmart 
that he obviously couldn't afford unless he'd come up with some money somewhere. So, like I said, it's either it's either somebody looked at Joe's story and looked at the things that happened those days and realized we can build a murder case around this, or Joe killed her and got paid the money. I mean, one of those two things happened. It's either somebody was very clever at looking at all the little coincidences that were happening and used it to build this story, or Joe did it. I mean, it's one of the two, and it is, I mean... These are the things that give me pause. I go back and forth on this case. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. We're going to talk about this for several days, but I do not have a I do not have a clear view necessarily of what I think happened in this case because I feel like there is a push and pull of evidence and statements. And this is a really interesting one, I think, because if you can step away and sort of be neutral on it, I think you'll see kind of how difficult it is to figure out exactly what happened. And you can see that there's not just, you know, this is not, this is not Timogen Kinsu. We talked about Timogen Kinsu and we talked about him a lot because when we looked at that case, it was just so obvious that there wasn't really a whole lot of evidence against Kinsu. You know, I mean, the prosecution got a conviction, but it's unclear how they did it. They pulled it off somehow, but This is not that case. This is not a case where it is obviously a slam dunk either way. And and that's why I think it's really interesting. And this is just another aspect of it where Joe suddenly comes into money at exactly the time you would expect him to come into money if he'd committed this crime. Right. Now, Joe testifies at trial that David paid him the $200 on this occasion. We've already kind of talked about that. But... That's, I mean, even if it were some prosecutor looking at all the little coincidences in, you know, the financial records and whatnot, you have Joe under oath saying that David gave him $200 on this occasion. Do people lie under oath? Absolutely. But there's something backing up what he is testifying to, and that is the purchase of all these things he didn't previously have any money for. And there's no indication that the day of Yvonne's funeral, he had some big job that paid him on the spot either. Now, on July 14th, the police interview Joe Wilkes. David is arrested soon after that. So that's the timeline, but we have so much more to talk about in this case. Next week, we're going to dive into Joe's statements. We've obviously told you what he said at trial, but Joe has given multiple statements in this case. He gave two statements to the police before his trial. We'll talk about those, and we'll talk about some of the differences between those two statements. He obviously testified at trial. You've heard most of what he said then. But then, after trial, he gave a deposition where his story was remarkably different, and he backed that story up at a hearing later on. And once again, Joe is the case against David. I mean, David's going to be convicted, and David's not there. If David did it, he hired somebody to do it. And really, the only way we know that is based on what Joe said. Now, look, I keep saying Joe's the only thing, but you've heard other things. And you see why this is a little bit more complicated, because it's the little things that happen around Joe that make you wonder whether or not he's telling at least some semblance of the truth. It's the statement to Rose Moore and Chris Campbell. It's the things he says to his, uh, the people he's staying with. It's the money suddenly appearing. It's the fact that he was at the mall. It's the fact he bought a knife. It's those little things that bolster what Joe is saying. But if at the end of the day, Joe is actually lying, then David is innocent. He didn't do this. So we're going to look at that statement. We're going to talk about that some more. We're going to talk about more of the evidence in this case. We're going to talk about the knife and whether or not the knife could even have made the wound that we see. And once again, if the knife he bought in the knife, that's a pretty big hole in his story. We're going to talk about his clothes and where they were found and and what they tell us about this crime. And we're going to talk about the crime scene and what it tells us. There's lots of stuff to dive into, and we are going to continue to do that in our next episode. For now, if you haven't listened to Murder and Alliance, it's as good a time as any to start. If you want to reach out to us with any of your thoughts, questions, or comments, 
prosecutorspod at gmail.com at prosecutorspod for all your social media. We love talking to you guys. We've enjoyed so much all our interactions. Keep sending us those emails and direct messages. Hopefully I'm doing a better job of getting back to you. Love getting your suggestions for stories. We're getting tons of them. I'm adding them to the list and we are trying to cover cases that you guys want to hear. This case was requested by several people. It's one of the reasons we wanted to do it. And thank you to Maggie for letting us have all of the information that is made covering this case so much easier than it might otherwise be. And by the way, the fact that she did that just shows you she's really trying to get to the truth, which is so amazing. Remember, we come from certain people who've made timelines from publicly available information, make them private again, to Maggie Freeling, who has dedicated her life to reinvestigating this case. And for her to just open up her files to us is incredibly generous. And by the way, those of you who you know, don't know firsthand, she is a genius. And we know this from looking at her files, the way she digs. She is a good investigator. So go give her uh, podcast, a Murder and Alliance, a listen. And to keep praising Maggie, I mean, we made no promises to her about what we're going to say here or how we're going to come out. And she didn't ask. She just, I said, hey, do you mind if we cover this case? And she said, don't mind at all. Here's all the files. Go for it. So she is definitely looking for the truth. And we need more of that, and I'm glad we have Maggie around to look into these cases. Well, guys, that's all we have for today, but we will be back next week with more of this story. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutor. I've held a baby cup before, but I think it's like anti. Yeah, I think you're not animal supposed to do that anymore. Preservation right? or whatever. I did it in Thailand, but not that that oh, makes it well, any that better. Count. But it was not in America. Tiger Queen, Alice. Tiger Queen. <laughs> 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 uh, if only. If only. One day, Alice. Tigers like, on a gold leash. That'll so be I, us. So ready. Never been more ready. Okay, here we go.